there are times when things can feel so overwhelming and we are so back on our heels that we have to get outside of our head. And the best way to do that is to get into physical practices. That the, the um, imagery I like to use is that any moment we are either flat footed, forward center of mass, which is kind of leaning into life and feeling strong, or we're back on our heels. Many people wake up back on their heels. Many people feel back on their heels a lot of the time. So the question is, how do you go from mentally and physically back on your heels to flat footed stance and, some t- and maintain the ability to go into forward center of mass? How do you do that? Well, you do that by controlling the, this basic system in the body that we call the autonomic nervous system. It's a bit of a misnomer because autonomic means automatic, but you can think of it like a seesaw that on one end is our ability to get into states of alertness and focus. And at the other end is the ability to relax and get into states of calm or sleep or um, deep rest or focused, but relaxed. Maybe the even seesaw would be focused, but relaxed. And so much of of being functional is the ability to move from alert to asleep because sleep is so key for our health, of course, or from sleep to getting up and getting outside and exercising. But A lot of people get trapped at one end of the seesaw or the other, chronically activated or chronically exhausted. And the notion of a seesaw is is important here because it's not so much about your ability to be on either end, it's about the tightness of the hinge of that seesaw. What I'm talking about are tools that allow the seesaw to be calibrated so that it's very easy to go from sleep to alert, from alert to relaxed, from relaxed back to work, as opposed to getting locked in one position. That's really the key. And so I, I realize this is all, um, I'm talking all in an analogy now, but I think it, I'm hoping it's worthwhile because we've heard so much about mindfulness, which is a wonderful concept. We hear about mental health, we hear about physical health, but it's never actually been defined what is a mentally healthy person, right? Usually when we're talking about mental health, we're talking about mental illness. So to me, a mentally healthy person and a physically healthy person is somebody that can be in action when they need to be in action, can relax when they need to relax, can focus when they need to focus, and can sleep when they need to sleep. That's a pretty darn good life. And you can go, you can get a lot done and you can have very effective relationship to yourself and others with that kind of ability. And that ability is anchored in the nervous system. It's it's kind of nervous system flexibility, isn't it? It's that ability to adapt and utilize your nervous system in an optimal way, depending on what you need at any given moment. I think that hinge analogy is great. And and sort of just to just to sort of follow up on that, Andrew, I totally agree. You know, if someone is stuck in a negative loop or, you know, in a in a way that they're feeling, there's 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 nothing better than a physical practice to actually, you know, move them. You know, <laughs> movement is by definition, becoming unstuck, right? It's going to move thoughts, feelings. It's going to sort of mix them all up together. So I completely agree. I guess where I was going with it, and I'm really interested in your thoughts on this, is I have, like you, for many years, been trying to promote healthy, low-cost lifestyle practices. You know, I've written four, my first four books have all been about this, how you can inspire people to take on these things. But one thing I've noticed... Um, including with myself, is that some of my patients would do all the the best lifestyle behaviors, whether it's diets, good sleep practices, you know, breathing techniques, you know, but there's still a subsection who was struggling because they would allow the thoughts or the actions of other people to negatively influence them. And so for the last year or so, I've been writing my next book, which is really about trying to address this point of, you know, the way we think, we we can change the way we think. It's harder, it takes time, but we can train ourselves to think differently. And so a concrete example, let's say you were doing loads of great lifestyle practices. You know what to do when you feel stressed and anxious. You know you can use the physiological sigh when you need to, and you're in a good place. And then, um, your boss sends you an email that really upset you and wound you up. So you want to comfort eat, you want to have a glass of wine to de-stress. Yes, you can use the physiological sigh to calm yourself down and hopefully make better decisions because of that. But I'm also sort of thinking about, well, what if you could also 
not get triggered in the first place by that email? What if you could work on your mindset and change the way that you think so that actually you don't, you're needing these practices to deregulate, to downregulate less and less. And there are a couple of things that come to mind. And, you know, I am a big believer in uh, the fact that, well, what I consider the fact that subconscious processes, mainly um, brought on by our developmental models of attachment, really act as a filter by which we engage in the world. Meaning, um, if you grew up with a narcissistic parent or an, or, a, or an avoidant parent or somebody that had a quick temper, I mean, you would think the rational approach would be, okay, you're gonna do, you're not gonna be like that or you won't seek out people like that. But as we know, that is not how it works. Uh, Freud was probably right about the repetition compulsion, which is that we tend to engage in those types of dynamics over and over again his theory, which I rather like, is that we do that in order to offer ourselves new, many opportunities to respond differently. It's kind of an interesting concept. Um, I, I think that there, I once, I have a friend who's an analyst um, who I respect a lot, who said that basically all of um, Freudian psychoanalysis can be summarized in a three box diagram with two arrows. And that the first box says wish, and then there's, an, then there's a little arrow and then there's another box and it says anxiety. And then there's another arrow uh, to the right. And then there's a third box which says defense. And basically we have a wish, we want something, then we feel some anxiety around that wish. And then we have some defensive reaction. Unless of course, we identify what those arrows are and we understand the subconscious processes, in which case we can intervene in our own thinking. So this is completely separate from the kind of conversation we were having earlier where it's like do a physiological side. The whole idea is to make the unconscious conscious. And so the email from the boss that shows up, you know, we can think, okay, why do I get so triggered? You know, I mean, oftentimes an email from a boss is pretty important uh, and it makes sense to get triggered. But can we maintain the kind of perspective of, you know, are we a pleaser? Are we a rebel? Are we a person that, um, like I, for instance, I, I went into the profession I'm in because I don't like to be told what to do. Frankly, I was, a, you know, my, my own mother had a hard time controlling me when I was a kid. And so I don't like to be told <laughs> what to do. I'm not a people pleaser, but the, um, there, there are people pleasers. And so, you know, how can we start to intervene with our own tendencies and see I think it's worthwhile, I will say this, um, it, and now it's just my beliefs, I don't have any laboratory data to support this, but most people, I would say 95% of the world, does not do any hard ongoing psychological work to try and better them, themselves and adjust their thinking. Sadly, it is a matter of resource, but it's resources and lack of resources, but, but most people don't. So that means that 95% of the, the misbehavior that we see in the world is coming from kind of untrained nervous systems and people who are not super reflective. I'm not, I'm not being disparaging of them, but I think that's the reality. We also have to remember that, and this is actually very useful for online interactions where people get crazy comments and things. Just when I first started teaching in university, a colleague of mine who's a psychiatrist came to me and said, just remember, 1% of the world is schizophrenic, has schizophrenia, right? Um, about four to eight percent are dealing with a bipolar disorder of some sort. About ten to twenty percent are dealing with anxiety disorders, OCD. He starts listing all of them off, and then he says, "So when things happen and you're and you hear or see things that are that are concerning, just remember to filter them through the reality of mental challenge." And so you start when I used to get comments online and someone's being very aggressive. I think to myself, "I'm like, wow, like they must be." Um, struggling in some very intense way. I think that, and I say this a little, you know, I'm smiling as I say it, but it, but it's, it brings me both a, a lot of relief for myself, but also I think we need to acknowledge the sadness around this is that our species is, is very flawed. We're an amazing species, but we're very flawed yeah. in that unless we intervene in our own internal processes, uh, we're apt to just shed our our inherited and our um, learned and our innate dysfunction onto one another. Yeah. So I think a lot of learning to adjust one's thinking is about the acknowledgement that most people are dealing with um, a, a challenged nervous system to begin with, and that it's a lot of wor work, but well worthwhile to 
uh, to be one of, to try and make oneself one of the healthy ones. When you look at a lot of the dysfunction and the despair in the world, and a lot, a lot of it is the consequence of people who just are not very self-aware and are not taking care of themselves or other people. So uh, when that email comes in from your boss, I wouldn't recommend you know sending them a, a recommendation for a you know a, a clinical seminar to help them get some relief. But I often look at it and think, wow, it's incredible how. Um, how angry somebody seems about something that, you know, is kind of easy to deal with or is kind of trivial. Um, they must be pretty dysregulated. Um, yeah. they, they must have a really hard time regulating. And, and again, I don't say it from a stance of, of, of better than or disparaging. I just think that we, we are not very good at taking care of ourselves and it takes a lot of work. And that's why I orient to the physical practices yeah. first. It's like, let's talk about concrete things to get into the stance so that one can then do the deeper work because the deep work is hard and it takes years. Yeah. Even cognitive behavioral therapy takes a long time. And so that's why I've oriented my public facing work more towards the things that everyone I believe can and should do. I, it's about adjusting the stance that we're in to be able to access the deeper work. But I love that you're writing this book. As you can tell, um, I'd love to share a meal with you sometime or a long walk. Um, and chat about the psychological aspects and the, the, it, of this and thinking because, I mean, that's at the heart of, of how we experience life. You know, I, like you, have always focused on these practices. I, I decided to go here because I, I kind of feel a bit like, you know, the breath, the way we breathe influences the brain, the stress signals coming into the brain influences the breath. Same with the visual system as we've already spoken about. I kind of feel that our thoughts and our mindset can also totally influence our behaviors and, and what we might want to do, how we might choose to do it. But at the same time, yeah, I, you know, like a lot of people know that if we focus on the action, and the behavior, we change our states immediately. And, you know, I, I kind of feel it's a two way thing. It's not necessarily either or. And sometimes these physical practices, especially these ones that can be done regularly, are really good to keep us tuned up and ticking over. So in the backgrounds, we're in a better position to actually start working on these thoughts. And even what you said about your colleagues saying, hey, Andrew, look, um, you know, this percent of people uh, currently have schizophrenia, this percent of people have this. That's kind of mindset in some ways, isn't it? Because it's then it's helping us view those comments through a different lens. So instead of getting triggered, we can immediately go, oh man, there's a lot of people out there who are struggling and they're just sort of putting that out on me. And I love that untrained nervous system because you, I, I've heard you talk before about your, um, your teenage years. I don't think we can have time to get into that today. Uh, maybe on a part two, if you have time at some point. Um, but when we think about what you've said before, that a lot of the, the bad things that happen to us in life come about because of a dysregulated nervous system or an inability to manage it, I know from doing inner work and therapy, which again has taken years, I sort of feel that my nervous system used to be tightly strung, right? So I could do lots of lifestyle practices, but it was on the background, on the bedrock of this tightly strung nervous system. And as I have processed traumatic experiences early on in life, as I've done various forms of inner work, um, I sort of feel there's more kind of flexibility and spring now in my nervous system. So I feel that I need less of these um, symptom relief tools compared to the past. Or if I, if I use them, I can go deeper with them now, whereas before they used to just get me back down to baseline. Yeah, that makes very good sense. And I think that, you know, I, I find this too, you know, I've been doing practices for a long time. It, when I, I noticed like a couple of weeks now I've been traveling a lot. Life's been particularly busy and a little stressful, frankly. And um, then I tend to orient back to the tools as the bedrock of my well-being. I noticed I missed some of my sunlight view. I'm human. Sunlight viewing, my sleep was really off. So I go back to those bedrock practices, but I don't rely on them quite as much as I used to. Um, and I like this idea of flexibility and range, you know, feeling comfort in ex exploration and feeling range. And I think that um, I mean, I think part of that also, if I may, is just, I think it's a, it's a sign of, of just general maturity that, yeah. you know, this notion of this too will pass, um, a child can't really understand that because they haven't had enough bad experiences. Um, 
You, you know, you go through a couple hard rounds in life or more, and you realize you, for most people, fortunately, there are ups and there are downs and there are seasons. And you learn to, to lean into sometimes even the, the sadness of, of a loss or, or a challenge because you know things are going to pass. You also lean into the gratitude of opportunity and the gratitude of, of a close connection. And, th and that connection can be, you know, with your uh, an interaction with your dog or even with yourself or with nature. And, and you just can marvel at how amazing life is because you have an enormous data set to compare it to for the engineers in the audience, you know, it's signal the noise. If you are experiencing something, how do you know what that, how great or her, how lousy that is except relative to other experiences? So I think that we, as we get healthier physically, we become healthier mentally. And as we become healthier mentally, you're right. We don't have to rely so much on these support, um, physical support systems, but it's good to know, I think that they're always there and that they work the first time and every time. If you enjoyed that clip from my podcast, here's another powerful clip that is really going to help you with your health and happiness. I'm on a mission to get every human being to add one thing to their morning routine. This takes five days to work before you have an enormous breakthrough in how you see and relate to yourself.